Good morning and welcome back to the program where we talk about the fascinating world of New York City real estate and the people behind all of it. I would like to welcome my listeners and viewers in the United States and all around the world. I am Vince Rocco and it's Tuesday morning, so this is Talking New York Real Estate. And at this hour, the term aspirational relates to or is characterized by aspiration or a strong desire for something. For example, your aspirational goals for the new year. And oftentimes that leads to one living in a dream world. Fact. That said, I believe that the year 2024 stands as a pivotal moment in our city's real estate history characterized by uncertainty, resilience, and the imperative for strategic foresight. Aspirational thinking will oftentimes take you in the wrong direction. For example, predictions on our market activity. I believe this year brings more concern and uncertainty from the Fed Reserve, a, pre a presidential election year, and a Congress out of control. All of this unleashes uh, unease rather affects our numbers in sales and rentals in New York City. That is why today I am looking to my experts to break it all down for us. We will have all that and so much more as Talking New York Real Estate gets underway on this Tuesday morning. And in the news this morning, according to our chief economist, employment rose by 353,000 jobs in January, easily beating the 185,000 Dow Jones estimate. The number of job openings rose to 9.026 million in December, its highest level in months. The S&P 500 rose for the fourth straight week to a record 4.958 million. The Fed Reserve held rates steady and made it clear they are not yet ready to cut. Consumer confidence rose to its highest level in more than two years. Mortgage applications to purchase a home fell 11% as the supply of homes for sales remained very low. The average 30-year conforming mortgage rate fell to 6.63%. An increase in supply uh, has rental prices starting to come down. Bloom, uh, Bloomberg reported recently that premium properties in the global market will have a challenging 2024. A brokerage firm in the UK has predicted that in many cities across the world, residential capital value growth will slow this year, going down noticeably compared to last year. In that report, the anticipation is that the 30 global cities uh, it monitors, at least a dozen will see uh, their high-end worth homes uh, come down. The lowest gain rate since 2019 and down from 2.2% 2 .2 in 2023. Impacted cities include Hong Kong, New York, and San Francisco, the three cities driving the trend. To blame? High interest rates, the shortage of available properties, and each of the nation's current political and property market conditions. And finally, there is always a story that is different from the flavor of the day. So there is a new record for downtown Manhattan townhouse sales. An unknown buyer paid $72.5 million in an off-market deal for a double-wide home in Greenwich Village. And Auntie didn't sell it. The deal was downtown's most expensive ever for a townhouse, surpassing a $59 million sale in 2016, but still falls short of the city's priciest for townhomes, which was $77.1 million for an Upper East Side mansion in 2019. The seller bought the West 11th Street property for $31 million in 2016 from a couple who in 2014 paid $19 million for what was then a dilapidated 11-unit residential building with two rent-stabilized tenants. The tenants ultimately left and the new ones were able to renovate uh, before flipping it. You see, it's not all about doom and gloom. And with me today are Noah Rosenblatt, back from Urban Diggs, Jordan Silver from Brown, Harris Stevens, Auntie Jackick from Compass, and our chief economist, Greg Heim, who is calling in today due to the snowstorm here in New York City. <clears throat> All right, everybody, we have a bro show again this week. Isn't that something? So we have Greg Heim, our chief economist, on the line with us today because we had a little bit of snow this morning or a lot of snow, depending on where you are. And his travel in was not very easy. But, Greg, I want to start with you. So can you provide an overview of the current trends in our New York City uh, real estate market, particularly focusing on uh, the uncertainty of, you know, our market segments today based on your data, yeah, based yeah. on your research? I mean, look, things are okay. Um, I guess that's the best way to put it. I mean, we're looking not that different from last year at this time. Now, some people may say that's not great, but, uh, you know, we we had a little bit of a boost from the decline in rates at the end of last year. Rates have kind of been up and down in a narrow range so far this year, so we haven't seen any more momentum. But it's great that the stock market keeps setting records. 
uh, and the economy is doing much better than anybody thought it would. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword, though, because it's the better-than-expected economic data that is keeping rates from coming down. And just this morning, we got the CPI data for January, which was higher than expected. Ten-year rates go up, and going to take mortgage rates with it. So I guess continue to expect sort of an unevenness. And I think a lot of that will have to do with the direction of rates. Uh, but there's still a lot of money out there. We continue to see very impressive sales. Uh, you mentioned in your intro the townhouse sale downtown. So there's still people willing to invest, and, and there's still a lot of demand for housing here. And another thing that we found out recently is that the rental vacancy rate in New York City is only 1.4%. That was from the housing and vacancy survey that the Census Bureau does for the city every three years, or roughly three years, which shows you that, you know, even with rec- you know really high rents, the demand is still there. That's the lowest rental vacancy rate since 1968. I was going to say, I don't even so remember that, a, a number so low. That's really amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. And, and these surveys are done because they're part of rent stabilization. If that vacancy number got too high, then rent stabilization would conceivably go away. But I don't think our state legislature is ever going to allow that if they can help it. Uh, so, you know, we had a little bit of momentum last week. Contract signed kind of, were down from the prior week and a year ago. But, you know, week to week data can be a little, uh, you know, extreme from time to time. So the one thing that that, that has surprised everybody, and, you know, Noah can weigh in on this too because he looks at it maybe even more closely to me, is prices have not moved. You can go back to the worst of COVID, to the unprecedented rebound from COVID, to mortgage rates rising prices here in in Manhattan and and, in a lot of parts of New York city have not moved much. Maybe they're just slow to adjust. Maybe it's because prices didn't rise too fast when we rebounded from COVID that they didn't have to fall when things slowed down. You know, you would have bet your life that the increase in mortgage rates that we had would have caused prices to come down significantly, but that just hasn't happened. So um, expect the unexpected, but things are still as good as we could hope for. I think things will get better later in the year once mortgage rates really start to come down. But for now, forget Fed rate cuts. Not that they have any direct correlation to mortgage rates. Uh, Expect up and down movement in mortgage rates as we continue to get some of this better than expected data. And expect some stock market volatility. And that's that's kind of I think where we're at right now. Yeah, I mean I think it we're I think it's going to be a, a continuation of kind of uncertainty. At the end of the day, I think we're going to see a lot of tick up in a lot of different areas. But I, I'm I'm still a little hesitant to say that we are on the mend or we're on the rise or things are going to change. You know, with the flip of a switch, um, as uh, you in, or as people indicate. It's uh, it's interesting, and I have the brokers here. That you know, two brokers here are going to talk a little bit about um, their perception of the rental market. But Noah, chime in a little bit about what you see. You know, the trends that you're following, the trends that you see on Urban Digs, your database. By the way, we got you know the the te- uh, the data nerds here. You know, today both guys. So you're going to get all the best. Hey, 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 hey! hey. I'm far <laughs> too good looking to be called a data nerd. I know I'm not on screen. But you're not, uh, you're not I'm not going to speak for an hour. Well, but I, I am not a, a data nerd. Well, but, I am a but you, but you, handsome, well-spoken guy. Uh, okay, uh, now, now there. there's talent at its best, right? Okay. Yeah. I agree with you, Greg. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not handsome. Um, <laughs> definitely nerdy. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you well, know. Your overview on the current trends today, right, what right. you're seeing out there, what – more as it affects, you know, the uncertainty of the markets that we've been in for the last year or so. And yeah. as we approach 2024, and we're what, February, halfway through February? Yeah, we're just in the beginning of the spring season, right? right. So it's so the activity is, is right around the corner for the next three, four months. Our, our top months are March, April, May, June. So that's our yep. four best months. Um, 
I mean, the rental market, let's just, let's just follow up on what Greg said about the rental market. The rental market's strong. It's doing its thing. I mean, it came down a little bit from last year, but it didn't come down a lot. And, you know, you got to think that the rental market is going to act as a backbone to whatever the sales market's doing, right, in some way or shape or form. It gives an out to sellers. If they can't get their price, they could tap that rental market. Um, and I, and I, I think that the sales market did have a downtrend. When I look at resale um, condo price per square foot, I, I like to look at that versus median sale price because it's median sale price is too erratic. But when I look at um, resale condo price per square foot by contract sign date, we do see the market down around eight nine percent through this whole cycle, like peak to trough. I mean, so it wasn't a big down move at all. But the latest data in November has that bouncing up again, a little bit. It's like October was the was the bottom point. So in my opinion, when you kind of consolidate the fact that this has been a long, a long journey um, in, in a negative way for Manhattan real estate, I think that we have been through 19, 20 months of difficult um, weather, for lack of a better word, since the Fed started hiking rates back in um, spring of 2022. Spring. Yeah. And here we are in spring 2024, right? And I think a lot of buyers probably don't feel like they're getting deals and, and they may not be right now um, because inventory is so tight. You know, inventory is uh, is very tight as we were talking uh, before the show started. But, you know, I, I still keep going back to, you know, the um, I'm in this business 22 years and I've seen many ups and many downs, many strong markets, many weak markets, you know, bidding wars, no bidding wars, lack of inventory. But I have to say that in the last well, since the spring of last year, uh, last year, twenty no, spring of twenty two, right? I have never seen such a horrible, bad market, and only because it's lasted longer than the the changeable markets last. My opinion. Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do with interest rates. I mean, in my, in my particular book of business, I have sellers who need to and want to sell and upgrade but they can't or they're reluctant to, and their reason is because I'm going from a three or 4% interest rate, and now you're telling me I gotta spend six and a half, or when it was seven, or a little over seven. So yeah, I get I'm making some profit on my on my resale, but my monthly payments, which everybody's concerned about monthly payments, are going up. Yeah. You know, so I've gotta put more money down maybe to have less of a, a, a monthly payment, but. It's a psychological impact, I believe, on people when they think I have this and now why do I want to go to this? Especially when there's not a lot of supply to choose from. <clears throat> and mean, there's not and a supply. lot of supply. Right. Locking me there are locking mechanisms and, and we wonder what's going to unlock. Right. And when it does unlock, whether it's lower rates or by force they have to sell now, whatever it is, right. they're going to have to buy something else. So. Exactly, Greg. So, you know, a question to you, you know, uh, when you when you listen to the news, when you read your reports, when you listen to you two guys, you know, chat about the numbers, the economy is doing better than a lot of people want to give it credit for. Um, interest rates have. Yeah, but I, I, I think so they, there's a caveat there, though. Well, yes. You, well, Hiring is brisk. Um, you know, the the GDP numbers have been better than expected. But there's a flip side to that. And. <clears throat> moves people's moves because you know we always see you know there's two major measures of consumer confidence that come out and they don't always run in sync with each other no they don't but the the prolonged exposure to these higher prices you know has has hurt the american consumer to the point where there are some scary numbers now about credit card debt you know if you think about it we hit a trillion dollars not that long ago. In the fourth quarter, credit card debt rose five percent to one point one three trillion. Mm -hmm. We found out also that there was a fifty percent jump in credit card delinquencies last year. So, the American consumer who saw their, their COVID savings depleted has kept spending by running up record amounts of credit card debt at record Absolutely. high rates. Absolutely. So that that's, and the other problem is, you know, the inflation number today was a little higher than expected, but remember that core inflation, which excludes food and energy prices, has mm -hmm. actually is rising faster than the headline number because energy prices are coming down. So while people may feel better when they fill up their car, or heat their house, 
on snowy days like today. The the things that they their their absolute necessities that they need to buy that don't include food and gas, like housing, are continuing to go up. So yes, somehow the American consumer, which you know basically accounts for seventy percent of economic activity, is still spending somehow and keeping. We get retail sales later this week. We'll see what they say. But that that's that's my concern. Yes, if you look at the, the employment numbers, if you look at spending so far, if you look at the stock market, obviously is very happy. It looks like, wow, we're getting our soft landing and everything is great. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't think the Fed could pull it off, probably because they screwed up so much letting inflation get out of control. I didn't have any confidence they could fix it. Honestly, I just think they're getting lucky. But, you know, forget that for a minute. I can see why people can still be pessimistic because there are a lot of people, especially since student loan payments restarted at the end of last year, right. that are tapped out and are having wage gains are actually running a little bit higher than price gains, a little bit. But it's like the jobs numbers. You mentioned you know, 353,000 jobs, wages went up, but what we forget is hours worked went down. So even though people may be making more on an hourly basis, a lot of people are bringing home less because they're working fewer hours. Right. And that's a concern. So just like at any time, it's how you want to look at things. I, I'm being positive, saying that things are moving in the right direction. One bad inflation report, although this is the second straight month, it's coming a little higher than expected, uh, shouldn't scare us too much. But it's not that everything is fine because – there, there is the chance for a very noticeable decline in spending in the coming months. And you can't rule out a recession 100% at this point because that could be a very hard and fast thing where consumers just have to stop. And they're the ones that have to carry the economy. And that's, I think that's the concern that I have and a lot of people have. Uh, let, Jordan, let, let's talk a little bit about the rental market. You know, Greg mentioned 1.4% vacancy rate. It's the lowest it's been since the 60s, okay? I, I, you know, I can't even remember a stat that goes that far back. In your dealings on the rental side, um, why, in your opinion, oh, it, is the vacancy rate so low? I'm actually always really interested <clears throat> in the vacancy rate. I believe that number was quoted by a survey which landlords are not required to fill out, to my understanding, and that CHIP, the Community Housing Improvement Program, uh, they report different figures for their vacancies for warehoused rent-stabilized units. So there's a lot of vacancy truthers, is what I call it, people who are not sure about exactly how many vacant apartments there actually are, because we're going off of numbers from a survey, which are different than numbers from the landlord's tax forms, which show completely different vacancies regarding their rent-stabilized units, which sometimes they don't even report. Let, let, let's take rent-stabilized <clears throat> or rent-controlled, rent-stabilized out of the equation and talk about the, just the market general, in general. The general, And the, the yeah. free market rates. I mean, I'm still seeing things like, you know, I think at the high point last year, the, the uh, average one bedroom in Manhattan was well, well over $5,000, 5200 5400 whatever the number was. So on the, on the free market side, yep. okay, how does that compare? I mean, the rental market is tight, and especially in the downtown areas, everybody wants to live below 14th Street. You can't find a one-bedroom, decent one-bedroom for below $5,000, and you have to be ready to pay a 15% broker fee. Um, it, it, I'd say anywhere in prime Manhattan, the rental market is tight below maybe 86th Street. It does open up a little bit when you push to Harlem, Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, to some of these outer borough neighborhoods. Uh, Queens, I think the rental market opens up, but in prime Manhattan, in Williamsburg, uh, and yeah, it's it's tight. Noah, when you're looking at you know the overall stats, whether it's sales stats, you know rental stats, what pops out at you um, on the rental side? I mean, it, it's it's the activity's down. Um, however, the the prices are still high. So when you think about that, it's a tight rental market. It kind of locks people into place. And I, I mostly look at the sales sector. <clears> so <throat> I'm looking at the rental market as a supporting factor or cast to make calls on the sales side. Right. So when I look at doing a buy call like we did for sales, I'm looking at what the rental market's doing. I saw the rental market starting to recover a little bit. We factor that into the equation. But I mean, 
it's too intertwined. I mean, I'm not an expert in the rental market. I think Jordan's going to give you much more information in the, in the weeds of what's happening in that sector. Um, I'm just looking at the high level activity and the level of price action and how that may affect the sales market. And from what I see, it's going to be a supporting factor. All right, we have to take a break. We'll be right back after these messages. We are talking New York real estate right here at the On The More Network. Don't go anywhere. We've got a lot more to go. This beautiful set here at Studio 1873 is brought to you by the Everset. The Everset provides full-service staging and furniture rental solutions in the New York area. For more information, please visit us at staging.theeverset.com or email us at staging at theeverset.com to request a free proposal. Okay, everybody, we are back. Uh, Ante, how do you perceive the, the supply and the demand dynamics within the current market segment in New York City? So from a from a, a, a sales perspective, we keep saying that there's a mm -hmm. low inventory, right? But there's a high demand out there. From your perception out there in the field, and you're a very busy agent, how are you dealing with the imbalance of the, the supply issue? Look, I think in the last 12 months, every buyer was telling their broker, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for interest rates to go down. And it seems like the waiting kind of stopped post Thanksgiving because buyers were starting to pull the trigger. And a lot of inventory that was sitting went into contract, not in January, not in February now, but started going into contract like post Thanksgiving. The, sh the gray cloud over New York real estate was starting to shift. And it seems like the sun's coming out for sellers and buyers that were getting good deals. However, there's not a lot of new good inventory. For example, last time we had tight inventory in like 2015, 2014, there was a lot of new development buildings that were offering products between two and four million. Nowadays, new development products like five million for a good two bedroom and the market isn't always at five million, right? There's a lot of buyers below that five million threshold, and that's our biggest challenge right now. And if you walk around the city, there's not a lot of new development. Like there's no talk of new development. And the new development that's priced in that two to six million is like 50 to 60% sold without the project being completed. In your opinion, though, why? Because I agree with you 100% on the new development or lack of. And you know, I do a lot of work in our new development division, and I haven't had a project in two years. Why is that? What 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 seems to be the slowdown? Is it the developers dealing with the same interest rate issues, or is it just we're overbuilt? I mean, what is the issue? I think it's the land costs and finding land, and then the construction costs that have skyrocketed. That it doesn't pay for developers to build affordable luxury. It's just like high end luxury that pays. So it seems like. What is your opinion on the the number? Where does luxury begin, Noah? If people say four million. That we we get reports yeah. every week. Four million and above. You know, X amount of contracts signed. My two cents is so what? Who cares? <laughs> what is that number? Um, well, it's usually top ten percent, and that top ten percent is usually right around four million. I mean, sometimes that threshold will fluctuate. Um, I haven't seen it under four million for a a while, and if it did go into 4 million, it wasn't there for too long. So it's usually between 4 million and 4.3 million or so. Again, top 10% or 4 million, and a lot of people just use that 4 million threshold. But 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 so you would say that 4 million is that, I guess, that number where luxury begins? I mean, you could define luxury in a I lot mean, of I different ways. I mean, I'd say maybe six or seven. Yeah, I makes mean, more sense. some people will, will spend $5 million and be like, this is not luxury. <laughs> My but, point, right. But, so technically, it's just a matter of definitions, right? I mean, um, we had top 10% is what we define as luxury. If you did top 5%, it would probably push it closer to that 6, 7 level. Yeah. But top 10% has been like an industry standard for a long time. So it might be changing. Those goalposts might be moving up a little bit now. Uh, Greg, so, you know, from your perspective, any emerging trends that you're seeing out there that could be the catalyst? I mean, we all seem to agree that, you know, the year is probably going to be okay, uh, ticking up from where we've been the last, I don't know, 18 months or so. But, you know, do you see any trends out there that, you know, uh, might be the, that that ec that catalyst to really springboard us over the the hump, whatever that hump is, to what I call a productive market. Yet again, I I think people, as we said it earlier, the people are waiting for rates to come down. You know, it looked like after hitting a twenty three year high in October, you see rates drop over a percentage in you know the throughout the, the rest of 23, and people start to get excited. You're not even thinking about 6% rates. You're like, are we getting in the fives again? And then, 
you know, the, the, the economy shows that it's a lot stronger than anybody thought. And now we're, we're looking at rates that are essentially flat. So I think that we need them, we need rates to get noticeably lower to unleash the buyers. I think that I, I hear a lot of talk about how tight inventory is. And, and to be honest, it's, it's, the data doesn't show it being that tight. The data shows this market is, is more balanced than anything else in terms of the month's supply of apartments. Well, talk that's about not in every about... segment. That's not in every area. That's not every size of apartments. But the thing that's kept Manhattan prices in check and, and has kept deals coming is a healthy level of inventory. If we had the inventory problem that the rest of the country had, We'd be in a lot of trouble because yeah, prices would have spiraled but, out of control. Yeah, but talk to me about listings, though. Listings are down, so they're across the city, so and across companies. So I would assume that because listings are down, inventory is depleted, and it's not growing. Well, it's the point. time of the it's the time of the year. I guess this is the time where we all start to try to get a handle on what the spring market is going to really look right, like. Right. You know how much product is going to be out there. Um, you know, and, and I, brokers always say to me, I, I don't care how much product, it's got to be the right product. You know, there, right. there may be X, you know, 7,000 apartments out there, but nobody wants any of them. And, and I think that that's I true. Right there now, are, that right. there are segments that are languishing. Uh, I, I had Michael Vargas on my podcast this week and he was talking about, you know, unrenovated co-ops and the challenges. Anything that needs to be renovated is is at an extreme disadvantage because of the cost of the renovation. Right, and the timeline. You know, and the timeline, and the timeline when, when there are uh, all you know alternatives that provide a lot more amenities and, and no co-op board to deal with. So, uh, you know, it's an uneven thing. I think the biggest thing that's going to help us is in the second half of this year, rates are going to go lower. And I think that will bring more buyers out. I do think that there are there is a lot of this pent up demand because it was such a slow year last year, uh, coming off a slow second half of, of 22. So there, there certainly is a lot of demand. Uh, there's a lot of money out there waiting to jump in. I think people are just waiting for rates to get to get lower again. They feel like they missed the boat at the end of the year, and, and now they have to, to wait till they, they notice me and. You know, the, the thing is, you, you don't want to root for a recession. But I, I think I said this last time I was going to show that a recession would get rates down like that, you know, and, and get this market humming. But it's not necessarily the best for the long term uh, health that, of our market. No, that may be correct. And the, the word recession is something that scares the bejesus out of everybody. So I, I'm not I mean, I, I agree with you, but. I'm sort of on the fence with that, but let me ask my two gentlemen over here um, with regard to what do you think, aspirationally or whatever, what do you think the right interest rate number should be to really spark that trend upwards in buyer activity? I mean, we're at, what, 6.6% today, 6.7, whatever the number is. What's the right number? Uh, I feel like it, once it hits like 5.7 or 5.5, like we are booming, like everyone's rocking and rolling and sellers yeah. that were waiting for interest rates to come down to upgrade will be able to digest the 2% higher interest rate for that upgrade. But th could they digest 3%, 3.5%? I think that's the challenge with new inventory coming onto the market. The sellers that need to upgrade aren't upgrading. They're still waiting. They're still waiting. But Jordan, let me ask you this. So when you're pitching a, an exclusive, a sales exclusive, and you know a seller has, which I've done multiple times in the last X amount of months, 3%, 3.5%, 4% interest rate, okay? And the, the argument back is, well, you know, I have to almost double in some cases what my interest rate is. So I don't know that I want to do that. I'll sit back and wait a little bit. Do you have the conversation with them about the history of interest rates, the fact that where we are today is not so abnormal, you know, where we are today is pretty normal, where we were at 3 and 4%, that was done for a specific reason, right, after COVID, to get activity out there. Those are not normal numbers, and we will never, ever see those again. It's rare that I'll have conversations with sellers about the rate as more of the conversations are leaning towards pricing. They're not getting the prices that they want. Okay. Go ahead. So 
most of the conversations are price adjustments and how we can get realistic with pricing. In terms of rates, a lot of the sellers are aware that the 3-4% COVID rates were a statistical anomaly. Um, so a lot of it comes down to just why is the property not selling? And properties, the properties that are selling, the only ones that are selling are the ones that are aggressively priced. Well, and I agree with you. But, you know, when I, I came into this business 22 years ago, and the first thing my first manager said to me, make sure you price everything correctly because if you don't, and that's a market however many years ago, because if you don't, it won't sell, it will sit there, and buyers will say, too much money. Yep. But that's a standing kind of argument with, with sellers. But, you know, of course, and I say this every week on the show, they got gold bars between, you know, the sheetrock. So they think their property is worth 10 times more than it really is. Yeah. I, I think also to add to that, you could price an unrenovated apartment below the last comp and it still won't move. And I would say 40% of our market in Manhattan needs a renovation. Mm. Yeah. And even if you underprice it, properties are still not moving. And that tells me it's a product issue. People in this market just do not want to do a renovation. It's either price or product. Well, the well, I agree with you on the bottom line on the, on the renovation thing is, you know, when we had supply chain issues and problems with that a couple of years ago, I was selling a new development where we couldn't start closings because the refrigerators that were ordered for every unit in the development were floating in the ocean somewhere because they just couldn't get to the U.S. And I finally pitched a fit after months and months and months of buyers pitching a fit with me because we couldn't start closing. I said to the developer, cancel the effing order. Order something new and order it from the U.S. He did, and we had him in two weeks. So people, you know, in renovation is, you know, they think the same thing. Timeline is extended longer than it ever was. Prices are probably double what they ever were. I mean, what is an average cost of a renovation in New York City these days? 200000 and that's on the low side, right? Yeah. yeah, and then there's perception. I mean, there's what it will cost at the end of the day, and then there's what a buyer thinks it's going to cost, well, and they bid absolutely. accordingly. I mean, if they if they value it two hundred, all right, it's going to cost me two hundred, two fifty. I'm bidding down three hundred, three fifty. Correct. Talk about you know in in comparison to other cities. I mean, I said something earlier where Hong Kong, San Francisco, New York City, kind of leading the pack of you know a slower market. You know, which is indicative around the world. But when you get people coming in, and I know until you do a lot of international buyers, when they come in from foreign lands, are they um, looking at our markets from a price perspective, an interest rate perspective, or just happy and excited to be here to own a piece of the rock in New York City? I think that depends on the buyer. I mean, I, I've been seeing a lot of parent, very wealthy parents buying for kids yes. that are international, and their perception is they don't want to pay rent. So they have a different attitude than the person that's very established that's looking for a pied-a-terre on Central Park with the view, right? For them, the you know, the cost of having it is irrelevant because they want a pied a to come to in the city with the park view. So if it costs three million or five million, it's not really a question. And the domestic buyer, are they thinking the same thing? Are they not thinking the same thing? Where is their head when it comes to, you know? I think domestic buyers are cost sensitive. Yeah. Even if they're high income earners, they are cost sensitive. In 2021, to spend an extra million or a million and a half, was no problem. Yeah, sure, we'll do it. 20 minutes later, let's do the deal. Nowadays, they're not doing it. Greg, talk, talk to us a little bit before we go to the next break. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, consumer confidence. I mean, we, we, we talk about this every week when we, look, when we, read, when we read your numbers on any economic, economic numbers. It always comes down to, you know, consumer sent, um, sentiment and, and confidence. You know, the confidence is up, the confidence is down, confidence goes back up again. It's like a, you know, a roller coaster. Explain to the viewers yeah. here what that is. A white well, I mean, well, think about it. If, I, if I'm surveying you, Vince, about how you feel about the economy, your, your opinion is going to be really, you know, influenced by your personal experiences, right? Right. If you drive a lot and gas prices go down, you're going to be a little more confident. You're like, hey, I'm paying... Three dollars a gallon instead of three and a half dollars a gallon. Right. If you if you don't drive a car a lot, that's, you, you're not seeing the benefit right now. What you're seeing is that prices are still rising faster than 
the Fed or anybody wants. So when you hear about all these jobs created and you hear about GDP rising faster than expenses uh, as it's been expected, it's kind of like seeing if the S&P 500 went up in a, on a day, yeah. but the three stocks you own went down, right? And I think that people live in their own world and what, what influences them. So confidence numbers can be very volatile. And again, you have you have two different surveys that are used, and one's by the conference board, one's by the University of Michigan. I, I, it's you, you can see just like with employment, you have the payroll survey, the ADP private sector survey, and the household survey that all tell you vastly different stories every month. So I, I wouldn't put too much stock. I know that it's great for politicians to tout high confidence levels and markets like to hear it, but. People are looking at the things that they're spending the most money on, which tend to be uh, shelter and food, are not going down. They're still going up. They're going up, you know, faster than anybody would want. And and therein lies the problem. Um, so yeah, you got to take you got to take it with a grain of salt because those two surveys can can disagree with each other and and it can jump. From, from month to month. Some people, I always say that you want to know consumer confidence, look at the stock market. Yeah. Well, Today, it's, it's taken a bath because of the, the CPI number. But that's, to me, that's a great mood indicator. Yeah, and the other day was booming and it was up higher than it ever was. Um, I, I have said, though, for a long time, it's the kitchen table issues. You know, I can only speak. Yeah, food and rent. Right. It's, food and rent is as kitchen table as it comes. Kitchen table. And those are not going down. No. And and that is, I agree. And that is what kind of, I think, drives the mentality of people maybe sitting on the sidelines and saying, and hey, listen, by the way, I might be able to afford to buy an apartment and I might be able to, you know, uh, accept, you know, the, the new interest rates or, or the new world of interest rates. But you know what? If the price of food keeps going up and, and the price of gasoline keeps going up or the price of you know energy, I know it was down recently, but keeps going up. I mean, that's what I need to you know take care of my family. So everything's said and done. Very sadly, I think the housing market always is the one that suffers the greatest. Noah, what is your opinion on that? It's not necessarily correlated. Okay. I mean, we live in a different world. I mean, let's just not forget that you know as the stock market went to all-time highs, over the last, what was it, six, eight, nine months, we've had a downturn. Yeah, We did not see any correlation there. Yeah. As as rates went down, right, from eight, almost eight to mm -hmm. like six and a half, we still were going down. And everyone's like, well, wait, what's going on? You know, now that rates are finding its home, I think that the markets need to adjust to the fact that the Fed's not gonna cut rates six, seven times. They think the Fed's going to cut rates six, seven. How are they going to do they that? They said it. They said three times this year, three times next year, and three times the year after. The, the Fed's saying really? one thing. The Fed's basically saying uh, we'll cut when we have to. He's a jerk. And and and, and maybe it's not going to be as much as you guys think. And the markets are thinking another thing. And the markets are probably wrong. And at the end of the day, the Fed's going to probably cut later and not as much this year. I agree. So rates are going to probably find a little stability after a lot of volatility, and that might unlock decisions. That might unlock decisions. You never know. Don't be surprised. And I love what Greg says with the stock market because you know what? He's right. You know, like we have to worry. Our biggest worries are a credit event that the Fed has to do something and a stock market crash. Yeah. I mean, that's to risk off, risk off situations, right? We got a risk off situation that might hurt us. But if we have a correction and not a risk off moment where there's like a waterfall price and, plant and liquidity goes away, prices are dropping 25, 30% everywhere. If we just have a correction, don't be surprised if Manhattan does its own thing and we even have a little recovery, considering where we came from. That's very important to understand. No, and, and I agree, and I'm rooting for it, and I actually can see a recovery around the corner. So again, this is not really meant to be doom and gloom. I, I'm just calling out the facts as I've seen and, them the last two years. And, right? and the data that I see right now, I'm telling you, I, I'm seeing liquidity come back, yeah. I'm seeing supply tight, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing price action starting to come back up with the most recent data. That's what I'm seeing right now. I feel like we're shifting, haven't shifted, but we're shifting. Shifting. Shifting is a good thing. Yeah. Okay. we got to take a break. We'll be back after these message. This is Talking New York Real Estate on the More Network. Don't go anywhere. What do you really need to know about buying or selling a home? First, 
It's serious business, and it's complicated. There's a lot of money on the table, and emotion too. You need an agent who knows the ropes. So, whether you're buying or selling your home, work with professionals who have a mastery of the craft. All right, everybody, we're back. So um, we're talking about, you know, the, the uncertainty of the, of the market the past year and a half or so. However, you know, I think we can all agree that as we march forward into 2024, and yes, there are going to be some other issues that may, may pop up. But, you know, I've said this for years on this show, and I say this in my, in my personal book of business of real estate, you can't keep New Yorkers down. You know, there comes a certain point in time, whether it's a COVID pandemic or 9-11 or, you know, financial crisis, Everybody kind of sits on the on the on the bench on the sidelines, and then all of a sudden, they run out of patience and they're running down the street because it's time to buy. I need to buy. I want to buy. I do feel that about to happen. My only frustration with all of it is, you know, I'm I'm a little more you know specific in my thinking, and if I can't pick the actual time that it will happen, then I get personally frustrated. But just so you know, I I do firmly believe it's going to happen. I'm just like impatient for that to 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 happen you know sooner rather than later but in the meantime you know you guys agents here uh, can can we come up with strategies or actions maybe to facilitate that push to get them out there um faster is there a way that we can do that is there not a way to do that i don't know i mean i'm trying in my own business trying to figure out what are the right things to say to buyers and what are the right things to say to sellers right to get them to start thinking the way I want them to think. I think a, a good line of thinking is that you can always renegotiate your rate, but you can't renegotiate your purchase price. That's going to be a, a, a classic, which is true. It rings true. Right. Uh, a, another reason for buyers is to get ahead of the curve, because that's what I'm telling them. As soon as those rates do come down, it's like a nozzle. You turn the nozzle, and the flood of buyers are going to be back out. You're going to be... right competing with all cash right. buyers, bidding wars. So you want to get ahead of that curve. It's been slow. Take advantage of the slower time and get in before the market gets crazy because it will at some point pick back up. 1,000%. So let me ask you, Auntie. So what is the price point uh, these days, okay, uh, that's moving better or faster than others? Is there a specific price point? Or is it all over the place? I, I feel like it's all over. To, all over. I just think that buildings with lower monthlies and renovated units are moving at, at lightning speed. Mm -hmm. All right. So I get that. So let's – and that then that says to me that rules out new condo developments. Noah, in your research, Auntie said before that that market's kind of you know slow right now. There's not a lot of new buildings out there. I 100% agree with them. Monthlies and real estate taxes are insane in new development. What are you seeing from your data research perspective? In front of, in terms of new development? Correct. I mean, there's not a lot of product. There's, it's very, very isolated. It's very local. You're going to have your winners. You're going to have your losers. You're going to have those that, that take the, the same amount of two-year time to sell out. But I think the overriding theme right now is is there's there's no product. I mean, there's there's economic reasons to, to not make that decision to file. I mean, when was the last time you saw a permits for new buildings and all that kind of stuff yeah. in, in a notable right. in a notable way. Not no, to say it's not they, happening. Right, but they're right. down. The, they're, the number of filings is way down. And this is something that started years ago. We actually talked about it in the pandemic. What's so funny is that we talked about this in 2021, and we we're like, wait till we get to 24 and 25, and here we are in 24 already, and we're like, guys, they're not they're not building anything. And, you know, you think about, are they going to build anything in a year from now? And they're like, no, they're not. There's no economic reason. And we had the residential sales market come down, Throughout the whole capital stack with new devs between rates and, and maybe higher higher loan amounts from investors, who knows what, what differences have changed over the last three years that are pausing these decisions um, in mass for builders to build. And that's going to have a long-lasting um, inventory constraining effect on our market. And it started years ago. So we're in, we're in the middle of it happening from years ago. And, and even if major things change now, we're not going to notice changes for couple of years from now. So we're in it. So I mean, like, I feel like we're in a supply situation like 2012, 13, 14, and 15. 
And once you start to get confidence back and once you start to get um, more risk on periods in a sustainable way and more liquidity coming back, imagine a situation where buyers are bidding on properties that need, need renovations. You guys are telling me that they're still focusing on those turnkey solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not buying those. Yeah. Wait until that goes away. Well, that's a liquidity thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the least amount of um, renovation that you need to do, the better, or none at all, even better, right? So that's that liquidity because, my opinion, things have raised, the prices have raised so much, have not come down really that much. So they're kind of trying to preserve in unquestionable times, the, in economic unquestionable times, they're trying to preserve that liquidity. Yeah. So renovating is going to cost them a lot of money. And there's not a lot of sellers at the margin. We've discussed no. this over and over. There's an, at the margin, there's not a lot of sellers that are out there that are desperate, fearful, panicked. Mm -hmm. I got to get out of this thing now and liquidate and get mm -hmm. my dollars back. Mm -hmm. On a mass level, there's not a lot of those guys. No. Craig, uh, you want to weigh in on the, on the new development aspect of uh, the numbers? Well, I think this, the thing that we forget, you know, uh, not not us, but other people that don't look at this is, you know, the dramatic decline in development in in the city, not just in Manhattan. You know, it seems like you, you if if you just read the papers, you seem like they're building a new record high skyscraper like every six months. But as usual, when when we have a downturn or any kind of slowdown construction stops and, and it's more noticeable now without a 421a replacement which who knows if the if they'll ever will ever right. get something out of Albany um, it, it, it's very difficult you know you we talked about the the rental vacancy rate but people who want to own homes find find a, a not just in Manhattan good luck finding things in Brooklyn and Queens for a reasonable price right I mean it, it's very difficult and the answer to all all those problems and by the way this is a nationwide problem most you know 85 percent of the cities that NAR tracks still have prices rising for housing even with interest rates still remaining high because there's no inventory so you need help from state and federal government to to particularly up in Albany to offer some kind of incentive but there's a very anti real estate bias up there. You know, we saw that with the changes to rent stabilization and, and going after broker commissions. And now, you know, the, 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 the other things that people are going after brokers about that I can't get into. But, yeah, we can you know, talk about I, that. Think, <laughs> I think they have to, the state and, and the mayor is trying to, to remind them of this. You've got to, we have a lot of outdated office buildings. A lot of people tell me that they're not good for conversion to residential. But I don't know, if you offered a deep enough incentive like we did with 421G downtown, maybe we would get housing. We need to build more of everything. Yes. Obviously, you know, there's there's the demand for the luxury housing out there. But there's also demand for more affordable stuff, and you're not going to get it without incentives. And, and that's why development now is a fraction of what it was in the mid-2000s you know, leading up to Lehman Brothers. Yeah, well, you know, from uh, just just to comment on the, the commercial to residential conversion, we did a show on that a couple of months ago here. It's very difficult on its face for a whole bunch of reasons, and, and a lot of it is the, the actual renovation of those units. You know, most of those commercial buildings, if you think about it, face the street with windows. Other three sides are brick walls or, or blocked in. So when you're converting each floor plate inside, it's difficult to do that and create windows. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why we can't do that. But I agree with you. We need to start building more of everything. I just don't know. And you mentioned before the 421A uh, or any tax abatement uh, help is really not in the future from what I can see. So who knows what that's going to really do. But I want to ask, you know, um, Jordan and, and Ante here, prices have increased, of course, through the years. Uh, and, you know, post, you know, uh, pandemic, they went even higher when everybody thought they were going to go lower. There really isn't or hasn't been any decrease in pricing, but yet we can negotiate, right? And we can be successful. We can still do deals and both buyer and seller can walk away and be happy. So your opinion, okay, well, for the most part, they're happy, but in your opinion, why can't we just start out and they, again, here's aspirational. We'll talk about that in my thoughts of the week, but why can't we 
start out with the right price and sell in, in weeks. I miss the days when we were in hot markets and you listed an apartment and you went to open house and you had offer papers on the table because that's how many people took them on their way out and 17 offers later after one open house. That was a wonderful thing. What's the what's the rub here? <laughs> Look, I feel like we're getting there. I I um I was in <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I feel like we're getting there. I feel like we're getting there. But um, most sellers that have a product that is in a you know one bedroom or two bedroom want to start at right. a higher price because right. they feel like their property is so special. And um, personally, at this point in my career, I only take things that are priced well. As you should, and you're very successful. Go ahead. Yeah, I would just like to, to chime in on that. It's because we're human. There you go. How's I that like with that for name? I mean, we, we're <laughs> like human. We're very emotional creatures. Yeah. We're, we're, we're psychotic creatures sometimes at, at, at times. Psychotic. Well, mm -hmm. um, sellers will believe that their property is the best thing in the world. Sellers will think that their view is the best. They'll think that the renovation that Gold they bars. did. Gold bars. Th that's what they think, whether it's, it's true or not. We have a false consensus of our life and, and everything that we do. So when we put the listing on the market where we raised our kids and we had all these beautiful moments, right? An attachment there. We don't want to get rid of it. We want to get, we want to get rewarded for this. Mm -hmm. And they also think about what they paid for it. They think about what they put into it. They think about their transaction mm -hmm. costs. And they think about that. And they're going to add all these things together right. and come to a lot, nice level. They don't want to leave money on the table. So they start out high. That's the misleading problem. You know what my question is? Because you're right. You know what my question is to sell is when they say, I don't want to leave any money on the table. And I say to them, what money are you leaving on the table? That's the thing. The market will do its thing. The market will do its thing. And in a lot of cases, I sell in the same building. So I know I sold them their apartment, so I know what they paid for it. So they're not pulling the wool over my eye. Okay. So what money are you leaving on the table? Yeah, but that's, not. that's the thought process. I, no, yeah. no, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just telling yeah. This is what I say to my sellers. And they finally say, well, yeah, you know, all right. Well, I guess $300,000 profit in a couple of years is not so bad, right? <laughs> no, it's not so bad. Talk a little bit about social media. Talk a little bit about um, media coverage in general, TV, whatever and the perception of our real estate markets. I mean, I remember when I first started in this business, the New York Times used to stress me out big time. Every you know Sunday real estate section that came out on Saturday had a negative story about real estate and the prices of this and the prices of that, and the market is bad and the market is that. I, I, I wanted to, you know, if I had a fireplace, just tear it up and throw it in the fireplace. Now we have, we don't have that, but we have continued news coverage, social media, how is that imp impacting our perception of the New York City real estate market, positively or negatively? It's hard to say. I guess you get real time updates now, you know, so it depends how closely people really want to follow along. Accurately depicting our markets, though? If you're looking at urban digs, I would say so. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but it people want entertainment on social media. People, you know, maybe you sneak in a nugget of information, but overall they want to be entertained. They want something to grab their eye, and that's going to be the best approach. But see, when you're talking about urban digs, okay, I agree. It's incredible because it's factual data. Yeah. And I don't have an issue with factual data. It's it, the embellishing of whatever else that you may see on social media or in a news report or whatever. That's what I don't really want to see or hear factual data and hey numbers are numbers right they are what they are you can hope for improvement or if they're you know really great you can hope that they stay great but i still have a feeling that overall uh media and let's just leave it at media okay not specific mediums um have an overall effect on on, on our marketplace i mean mm. every time you, you, you turn around they're talking about the housing market housing market housing market housing market Leave us alone, okay? <laughs> Focus on something else. Go talk about gas prices, sure. okay? Whatever. If anything, they also reflect, um, I think, a thought on consumers that this job's easy. As a, and it's, <laughs> you think I look like this on purpose? <laughs> no. Uh, it, it is a very, very difficult, challenging job, this New York City marketplace. And the nuances of this market and the knowledge base that you have to have and the, the – the experience and the strategies that you have to guide your buyers and sellers on. It's, it's, it's quite complex. It's not, it's not a simple. I thing. think, I think like this goes to something I said when that thing we can't talk about came to light in Kansas city, you know, residential real NAR. estate continues to, have, uh, you said it, not me. Residential real estate continues to have an image problem. We are letting people frame this industry and not doing a good enough job explaining what we do. 
you know, Best says this all the time. They put on a million dollar listing and it looks like you sell a $10 million apartment in five minutes. Right. You know, it, it doesn't, that's not the average broker by a long shot. And I think that we're not reminding people of all the work with no promise of payment that goes in. And, you know, I, 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 NAR is trying to push more of that now, and I know as an industry we're more aware of that. But this just goes to show you that when I was at Redney 20 plus years ago, life was a lot easier. You know, we we could stop things a lot easier. We we didn't feel like government was against us. Now we may have the courts against us. I I, I think that we have to frame what we do and not let anybody else tell people what we do. And we have the means to do that with social media. We can, we can go directly to the public, and I think that's something we need to focus on. And for people like me and Noah, you know, it used to be we had to give the data to the media and the public. Now they can go get it themselves. But that doesn't mean that they have, of course, our years of expertise doing it. But, you know, I think people need guidance, and we have to remind them that, that what we do add value. And if they're not sure what, what, how, then they should ask. And what we need to make sure we're, we're, we're promoting that a lot more. Thank you for wrapping that up for me, Greg. And you said it a hell of a lot better than I did. And Noah, I agree with you, too. It, it, look, it isn't easy. It's very hard. What we do, you know, uh, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of planning, and takes a lot of, you know, convincing of our clients because we are advisors. We're not agents and we're not transactionally oriented. I would hope that we're not. And that's how we, you know, can better service all of our customers. We only have time for um, one more question, and I wanted to ask. So this, as I said at the top of the show, this is a presidential election year, you know, and we're not getting into politics. I don't care who's for whom. However, typically in election years, right, we have a little bit of a stalemate. People kind of come back, kind of like, well, I don't go. And I've said for years, who cares? And involve or affect your housing choices or anything you want to do in housing. You know how people are, right? What current um, 2024 is going to be in our... I think it depends on the amount of... So it, it depends. Is it extremely chaotic time? That's going to cause... Uh, and slow the housing market it moves seamlessly. I think things could move seamlessly, but chaos. Well, you know it's not going to be seamless. Yeah. Plan accordingly. What do you think? <laughs> um, I feel like it would be a little bit... Last time, the election year was 20, 20 and a half percent interest rates. And this is happening. I think this time... I did deals, I remember, like, you know, 20th, it was like 2.4 or whatever. I know, I know. We are not getting now. So we had, you know, a cost drive. This time, you know, emotionally uh, overrule. I got one eye on credit spreads in the mm -hmm. All right, I love Greg's thing about the stock market. We've got to look at how that's going to affect us. It's the stock market, one eye on Manhattan. Just to see what's going on, Greg. Yeah, these things don't happen. You mentioned COVID. Uh, we've had others. We've had elections after the tech bubble burst. We've had elections after recessions. And as it stands now, the two candidates have both been president. So it's not as much of an unknown. It happened between now and then, for sure. I don't buy that people are going to buy or not buy because of the result of election. If they want to wait till afterwards and they're going to go through with it, I say take advantage of the uncertainty before and and take advantage of, of a little arbitrage moment and get in then. You want to buy when fewer people are buying. But, you know, at the end of the day, if it's the long, right long-term decision for you, waiting isn't always the best, you know, way to go about that. Um, you know, and, and so I, I, I don't buy a lot into people waiting and then buying anyway. Like I, I, why, why would you want to do that? If it makes you feel better, it is a huge purchase, 
fine, but I think you're missing out on an opportunity to take embrace the chaos. Well, they do it all the time on Wall Street. They're not afraid of a little chaos. No. And uh, I, I think if you get a nervous seller that doesn't want to be on after the election, uh, then, you know, that, that offers you great negotiability. My famous line, it is what it is. And by the way, that's our chief economist here at Brown Harris, Stephen, my friend, Greg Heim. And you must listen to his very enormously popular Crossing the Line podcast every week on the Moore Network. We're, going, we're coming back with my thoughts of the week. Don't go anywhere. Okay, everybody, we are back with my thoughts for the week. So aspirational pricing in the New York City real estate market can have several effects, both short-term and long-term. In the short term, it often leads to inflated listing prices and increased competition among sellers seeking to capitalize on the perceived high value of their properties. This can create a sense of exclusivity and luxury, attracting high-end buyers willing to pay a premium for prestige and status. However, it could also result in longer listing times and potential price reductions if properties fail to attract buyers at the initially set prices. Over time, aspirational pricing may contribute to market corrections as overpriced properties struggle to find buyers and eventually need to adjust their prices downward. This can lead to a more balanced pricing landscape and a more stable market in the long run. Additionally, aspirational pricing can exacerbate uh, affordability challenges by pushing up prices in certain segments of the market, making it more difficult for middle and lower income individuals to afford housing in desirable neighborhoods. Ultimately, the impact of aspirational pricing on the New York City real estate market depends on various factors such as economic conditions, buyer preferences, and regulatory policies. And that's our broadcast for today. Thanks to my guests for being here on set with me. You can follow me on Facebook, on Threads, Instagram, LinkedIn, or TikTok, at Vince Rocco, or my website, thinkvince.com. And John Wooden, one of my famous quotes, says, if you don't have time to do it right now, when will you have time to do it over? And to my listeners and viewers all around the world, from all of us here at Talking New York Real Estate on the More Network, thank you once again for spending a part of your day with us, and I will see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.